Hello, and welcome to the Audulus Build Podcast. Today we're going to discuss how to use Audulus with an Expert Sleeper's ES8 DC-coupled audio interface to create your own custom analog delay effect using an external Eurorack filter. The module you see here has several controls that emulate a broken lo-fi tape delay. This Audulus module used in conjunction with an Expert Sleeper's ES8 gives you the opportunity to sculpt a truly personal and unique analog delay using your favorite low-pass filter. We'll show you how to use this effect with synths you create in Audulus, with audio bust from a mix, and with external instruments, including synths like the Korg Minilog you heard earlier and direct in electric guitar. Before we explain how to wire up your system to use this module, let's first take a look at how this module is constructed and what the main difference is between a digital and an analog delay. This is the delay node. It's a simple digital delay with a range of 0 to 2 seconds. The repeats of a digital delay are near-perfect copies of the original signal. As the repeats decay, they simply get softer in volume. An analog bucket brigade delay, however, works a little differently. Each time a repeat runs through the feedback loop, it is attenuated by a low-pass filter. If the repeat weren't filtered, high-frequency clock bleed would accumulate on every return through the delay line, and you'd end up with a very noisy delay. The filtered, dark repeats of an analog delay sound natural because they mimic the way high frequencies in the real world are attenuated over large distances. Digital delays, on the other hand, can sound artificial in being too perfect. Although some of the tone of an analog delay comes from its various analog components, the majority of the sound of an analog delay comes from the low-pass filter itself. Knowing this, we can create a delay with Audulus and the ES8 using an external Eurorack low-pass filter that has the clarity and long repeat times of a digital delay with the dusky dark tones of an analog delay. Normally, the delay node's feedback loop is contained within the delay node itself. If we place the low-pass filter after the delay, this wouldn't work to get the analog sound we want. First, we attach a level node to the output of the delay node. This level node is our new feedback control. Make sure the feedback control on the delay node is turned all the way down. Next, we attach the output of the level node to a low-pass filter. Then, we attach the output of the filter to an add node. This will mix the dry signal with the feedback loop as it enters the delay node. We then make a control for the filter to adjust its cutoff. The lower the cutoff, the darker and more analog the repeat sound. Here, we'll make some text vias to mark the signals. This is where the dry instrument input would go. We'll also make a label for the wet signal as it exits the delay. Now is also a good time to set the delay node's mix control to fully wet as we're about to make the external mix control. Now, we just attach the dry signal to input A and the wet signal to input B of the crossfade node and there we have it, an analog modeling delay with a low-pass filter in the feedback loop. Now that we understand the basics of how to insert a filter into a feedback loop, let's have a look at the inside of the Eurorack Lo-Fi Tape Delay module. At first, this may seem a lot more complex than the previous patch, but once we break it down to its various parts, you'll see it's actually quite simple. This module can be broken down into three basic blocks. The input block, the delay loop and output block, and the time modulation block. This part of the patch is the input block. The input knob adjusts the amount of gain applied to the incoming signal. The input knob is squared by the first multiply node to make the response of the knob slightly exponential, which makes it easier to dial in high-level modular signals precisely. The knob range is then multiplied by 100, and then the incoming signal is multiplied by this amplification factor. This input range is enough to bring a low-level guitar signal up to modular level. This means you do not need a separate instrument amplifier to plug your guitar or other low-level instrument directly into your modular. Included in the input stage is a peak detector. This will flash a red light under the input knob if the incoming signal exceeds the negative 1 to 1 audio range. If you see this light flash, just dial back your input knob slightly. The input knob can also be turned all the way down to activate the internal audio input from Audulus. This allows you to attach a synthesizer you create in Audulus to the delay module. This knob switch module here routes input A to the output when the knob signal equals exactly zero. 
If the knob is turned up even a little bit, the module's input will switch to the second input of the ES8. The next block is the delay line output loop. This is essentially identical to the example patch we created earlier, only it's laid out a little differently. The main difference in this design is that the dry signal enters the feedback loop after the delay node. The reason I did this is so that the dry signal runs through the filter before being delayed. This allows for a darker repeat even at a low feedback setting. Other than that, everything else is exactly the same, and each signal is labeled with a text via to remind you where it's going to or coming from. This much larger section above the loop is the time modulation block. When you get down to it, all it really does is wiggle the time parameter of the delay in an interesting way. The modulation block has two subsections, the flux block and the wow and flutter block. Together these modulation sources will simulate a warbly detuning tape delay. The flux block simulates a cassette that has been left out in the sun, like the tape itself is warped and stretched. It does this by adding random variations to the wow and flutter modulation sources. The flux block begins with a control that is multiplied to a maximum of 10 Hz, which is the setting of the speed of the sample and hold output of the noise module. The random 0 to 1 modulation signal created by the noise module is then slewed to give a slope to the transition between the values. This value is then sent through a level node which controls the amount of random modulation that reaches the wow and flutter stage. The signal of the level node is sent downward here to a meter node to act as a visualizer for the random fluctuations. The signal is multiplied by a very small number to keep it within a tiny range that will make the meter fit nicely under the knob on the front panel. Before passing to the wow and flutter hertz inputs, the flux signal is multiplied into a range suitable for each parameter. This scaled modulation signal, now converted into a hertz value, is added to the base hertz values for the wow and flutter parameters. The wow and flutter block simulates irregularities in a tape deck's pinch roller and capstan. The pinch roller and capstan are cylinders around which the tape is guided as it moves over the playhead. Wow is caused by irregularities in the pinch roller. This is a slow sinusoidal pitch modulation of 4 Hz and slower. When turned up high, it gives the repeats a kind of seasick vibe. Flutter is caused by the uneven diameter of the smaller capstan. It fluctuates at 4 Hz or higher and gives the echoes a fluttering sound. Because it is smaller than the pinch roller, the capstan rotates more times per length of tape, which is what accounts for the difference in pitch modulation speed. To simulate these effects, we need a mix of two sine LFOs together. To give some more control over the sound, we've added a crossfade node which allows you to adjust the balance of the modulation signals from all wow to all flutter and everywhere in between. Some of the signal is tapped off of the sine LFOs to give some visual feedback through the RGB nodes which also indicate the relative balance of the modulation signals. The 0 to 1 modulation signal output of the crossfade node is then sent through a multiply node that scales the width of the modulation to a very small range, just 5 milliseconds maximum. Beyond this range, the wow and flutter is so extreme that it no longer sounds like an authentic tape deck. After the signal has been ranged, it is then passed through a level node, which adjusts the strength of the modulation. This signal is then finally combined with the time knob parameter and sent down into the delay node below. The time knob is squared to make it easier to dial in quick repeats, and then multiplied by 2 to take advantage of the entire 2 second maximum delay time of the delay node. The output of the sum of the time parameter and the modulation signal is then sent through a truncate module and multiplied by a thousand to get a readout of the time parameter in milliseconds. Finally, the modulation signal is also split off of the crossfade node and then scaled to fit into a small range that sits at the top of the module to act as more visual feedback of what the modulation is doing. It's unnecessary for the function of the module, but it's some cool eye candy. So that's it. Although it took a while to explain the how and why of everything in the module, it's ultimately pretty simple. 
Over half of this patch is used solely to create an interesting modulation signal for just one parameter of the delay node. Now that we know how everything works, let's make some sounds with it with various instruments and different settings. <laughs> Thanks for watching this Audulous tutorial on how to use the Expert Sleepers ES8 to create a custom analog delay. You can download this patch at the forum for free, and we'll answer any questions you have about it there or in the comments below. If you purchase an ES8 through Sentry Sound Labs on Reverb.com, you can get a free copy of Audulous for the platform of your choosing. If you enjoyed this tutorial, please take a moment to give us a 5-star rating in the Mac and iOS stores. It really helps. See you next time.